If you want to know you're making progress, see how your enemies are complaining about you. Next on Defending Life, find out how the black outreach of Priest for Life is making abortion supporters in Congress very nervous. I'm Janet Morena, Executive Director of Priests for Life, and I'm joined here today on our program by Father Dennis Wild, our Associate Director. Welcome to the program, Father. Thanks, Janet. It's great to be back. Well, of course, we always like to start our program with prayer, and today, of course, another prayer from our Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day, written by Father Pavone, our National Director. And today's prayer comes, uh, starts with a reflection from Psalm 23, which reads, I will fear no evil, for you are at my side. Yes, some think that Congress should never have intervened in the Terry Schiavo case. Either they are unaware of the details of the case or of the purpose of government. Terry, although brain injured, did not have any terminal illness, nor was on any form of life support, and did not require any medications to stay alive. Some did not believe her life, however, was worth living. So what is the government supposed to do when some citizens try to kill another citizen? Bless our leaders, Lord, with the courage to protect all our lives. Amen. Amen. And of course, our viewers can obtain Pro-Life Reflections for every day from us at Priest for Life, and we'll be happy to send it to them. Okay. Well, Father, as we said, uh, Early on, this is, show is about our black outreach, which is headed up by Alveda King. She's the niece of Martin Luther King Jr., also the daughter of A.D. King. Most people don't hear much about Alveda's dad, but it's Alfred Daniels mm -hmm. King. Uh, he works side by side with Martin. And uh, let's see what Alveda had to say about her work here at Priest for Life. Many times people ask me, how did you get involved in the pro-life movement? And how did you meet Father Frank Pavone? And, what are you doing there and what kind of work do you really do? And so many people are surprised about the title Director of African American Outreach. Well, it all started in New York and Priest for Life, of course, has uh, the home office or the main office in the New York area. And I met Father Frank Pavone in New York at a National Right to Life meeting. And he was speaking, actually preaching, because Father Frank is a preacher, and he's preaching about life and the importance of life. And then he began to quote Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And so, of course, my ears just perked up. I was already pro-life, but I was at that time doing work for school choice and uh, let's uphold the Ten Commandments, and something in my spirit just jumped. And as he began to quote Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., my uncle, and I said, my goodness, he's telling the truth. I had heard of Father Pavone, but I had not met him. We talked that day, and I began to say, you know, that is in that speech, that we should respect life, and infanticide is wrong. And he was quoting, I have a dream. He went over into a letter from a Birmingham jail. And as we began to talk, I began to tell him about my own life and the days of the Civil Rights Movement and how the new Civil Rights Movement, of course, has to be the pro-life movement. And so Father Frank and I began to work together a little bit, and he told me about a woman, Janet Morana. He said, you need to know Janet. And when I met Janet, you know, I said, hi, Janet, how are you? And as I look at Janet Morana and her work, and I was so encouraged when I met Janet. And I'm saying, Janet, silent no more awareness. What's that? Janet Morana was talking about women who were post-abortive, who regretted their abortions. And at that time, I had not really talked about my own abortions. I might mention it on the side or to a person, but never publicly. And so it seems as though Father Frank Pavone, Janet Morana, Priest for Life, I, I began to feel something in my soul and something in my spirit. And so I began to work first with Father Frank a little bit, and I began to appear on EWTN, which was wonderful. I began to be interviewed by Janet. And as I continued to 
talk with Janet, talk with Father Frank. I began to say, no, this is where I belong. And early in the 21st century, Father Frank says, okay, well, we've been speaking together, we've been doing television together, let's work together. And I thought that that opportunity was a little strange, I'll be honest with you, because here I am now, a public speaker, beginning to talk about pro-life, but black people didn't want to hear that message. And I knew I had to tell people about how terrible abortion was, how it hurt women, how it killed babies, how it was targeting black people. And what I found at Priest for Life, what I found at Silent No More Awareness a little bit later, was that there were people who were brave enough to tell the truth. And so beginning to tell the truth through my early experiences with Priest for Life would finally unfold into an experience that would reach many, many African American people and I'll always be very grateful for that. Praise the Lord. My name is Alveda King and I regret my abortion. Praise be to God. And thanks for the healing power of the Lord. In 1950, my mom conceived me and she had a brochure from a place called the Birth Control League. And it said, if you're pregnant and don't want to have a baby, come and see us. Of course, we know they became Planned Parenthood. My mother's mother, because mom wanted to go to college and the school she was going to, you could be married or not married, you couldn't be pregnant. They went to see their pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. He said, Naomi, sit down, let me tell you something. That's not a lump of flesh. That's my granddaughter. I saw her in a dream three years ago. And you have to realize there was no ultrasound back there. And that's why I'm here able to talk to you today. That became a family secret that my mother wanted to have an abortion. And she kept that secret until just a few years ago when she told it to Father Pavone and Janet Morana and then me. But over the next few years, uh, it, it just wasn't talked about. I got married the year after my uncle Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And my daddy walked me down the aisle, Reverend A.D. King, and then one week later, he was killed and thrown in our swimming pool. But out of that tragedy, I had gotten pregnant on my honeymoon and there was a beautiful little boy that was born from that. My doctor, I did not know it, was an abortion doctor as well as an OBGYN. So he birthed that baby, and I went for my six weeks checkup, everything was fine. I went back for a three months checkup, and I said, well doctor, I don't understand. You know, you've gotta remember I was young then, and I didn't know about a woman's body, and it wasn't so much talked about. He says, well, you don't need another baby, let's see, let's do a menstrual extraction. And that was a DNC locally in his office on a cold table with no knowledge. He didn't ask me, he just did it. Years later, I would go to Rachel's Vineyard and write a forgiveness letter to him, asking him to forgive me for hating him for what he had done to me. That same day that he did that procedure, and I remember it hurt, and I tried to sit up and get off the table, and he says, no, hush, be quiet and nurse hold her down and when she gets through, send her to Planned Parenthood, they'll help her. So for the next few years, this was 1970, I was post-abortive, didn't know it, had nobody to explain it to me, but I was sad, began to have problems with my weight, uh, there was problems in my breast and mammary system and uh, my cervix and all of this, a whole lot of things that he did on that table along with taking the life of my baby. So I was going to Planned Parenthood in 1973, a bill called Roe versus Wade passed on January 22nd, and we are here now to get all that corrected. That's my birthday. Today is my birthday. All right. All right. And so January 22nd, and I actually don't really celebrate my birthday. I do this. This is celebrating my birthday, being here with you. So that's how I celebrate my birthday, by the way. I've been doing it since 1970. But uh, they, uh, they say, well, we've got a safe procedure and it won't hurt as bad as having a tooth pull. That's a big lie. Of course, it hurts a lot worse and the repercussions and the results last a lot longer. And so I remember again, as all our friends are telling you, my sister's here, the cold table, it was very sterile, sound of a vacuum cleaner, I remember that. And, uh, I left there and, and supposedly everything was supposed to be okay now. And I went on, I ran for office, I won, I became an actress. I just started doing all these things but deep down inside of me, I wasn't me. 
in the mid 70s, I remember getting pregnant again, had had marital problems, health problems, emotional problems, but the world didn't know it. And so I was pregnant. I went to a man named Martin Luther King Sr. He never told me he saved me from abortion, but I said, you know what, granddaddy, I'm going to have an abortion. He says, they're lying to you. That's not a lump of flesh. That's my great grandchild. The baby's daddy was a medical student. And I said, I'm a liberated woman. A woman has a right to choose. Let's, I see some signs out there. Keep abortion legal, all this stuff. I'm, I'm saying this stuff, and I'm hurting all along inside. And the doctor, the baby's daddy, a medical student, he said, that baby has 46 chromosomes. 23 from you and 23 from me. I want mine back alive. <laughs> And I heard him, so they both kept saying, baby. The men, young men, said, that's my seed. That's my promise. No. And so that baby was allowed to live. And the sad thing even about that, sisters, though, when I saw the ultrasound of that baby, he was younger than the two aborted babies and the one who had been miscarried because of the damage from the abortions. And so all of this pain was there, and all of this, but because of a Christian man, Martin Luther King Sr., who was on a rescue mission, because of a medical student, and then in 1983, I got born again. And I repented for my sins, including my part even in abortions that I really didn't try to get. I was coerced and manipulated. But the Lord healed me. I went to Rachel's Vineyard, and I joined Janet Moran and Georgia Forney, and I'm silent no more. So I'm here to tell you that the Lord will deliver. He will heal. And the best therapy after we get healed ourselves is to go out and do what we're doing, tell the truth, and shame the devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's why I'm silent no more. And God bless you. Let your light so shine. And God just bless you. Hallelujah. Well, there's a lot to talk about when Alveda's involved, but we will have more to say when we come back right after this break, and we'll discuss the work of Alveda King. Stay tuned. Powerful new voices are arising in the debate over abortion, the voices of those who have actually experienced it. From coast to coast, women and men who have lost children to abortion are speaking out about its pain and devastation and about the healing and forgiveness they have found through the pro-life movement. Their witness is changing hearts and minds. Former U.S. Senator Zell Miller writes, the most poignant sight for me at this year's annual pro-life march and demonstration in Washington, D.C. was the large number of women holding signs saying they regretted their abortions. And the United States Supreme Court wrote, it seems unexceptionable to conclude some women come to regret their choice to abort the infant life they once created and sustained. Severe depression and loss of esteem can follow, a decision so fraught with emotional consequence. Welcome back to our Defending Life program, and we just saw Alveda King, who is an associate of Priest for Life. She heads our Black Outreach. And you know, Father, we have to say a big thank you to our Defending Life program in EWTN because before Alveda worked full-time at Priest for Life, we had her as one of the guests on our program to talk about the fact that she, her daddy, A.D. King, her mom, they're all 100% pro-life, always have been. She says it's in her DNA. And from that, you know, we invited her to be part of our team and the work has grown tremendously around the country with the African-American community, so much so that in 2012, both the Congressional Black Caucus and the Pro-Choice Caucus in Congress had a, a hearing, like a briefing, and they had handouts. It was called a briefing on African-American attitudes on abortion, contraceptive, contraception and reproductive justice. I don't know how they get reproductive justice in there. There's nothing about, it's more injustice, right? But they were handouts, and I'd like you to read for us, Father, the handouts they had, some of the quotes they gave us. Why don't you tell us some yeah, of Yeah, this was a question about black genocide. It was a question they were asking, and the uh, the selectively co-opting civil rights rhetoric to present abortion. They're saying that we're moving into the territory, really. 
And one of the quotes here is talks about Dr. Alveda King, was we just mentioned, whose full-time position with Priest for Life was first funded role of a black genocide activist. Her main strategy, and critics say her sole qualification, <laughs> has been capitalizing on her uncle's legacy, often asking, how can the dream survive if we murder the children? So they see this as a, there's something about right. that that they don't like to hear because it's destroying their efforts mm -hmm. apparently. They feel threatened. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Alveda King, another black genocide spokesperson, make ample use of imagery that aligns the anti-abortion cause with the civil rights movement. Well, I mean, it does, but they didn't like to see that either. And then down below, there's another quote here. Uh, to talks in, in an email interview. Father Frank Favone said that the language of the civil rights movement lends itself seamlessly to the anti-abortion cause. After visits to Martin Luther King's Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and the King family, Favone said, I have thought to myself, the message is exactly right. Nothing has to change except to include one more group of people, the unborn. And that again, I, as I present from this, they don't seem to like that inclusion. Right. And of course, Father, you know, it's the pro-life freedom rides that this network also showed that galvanized uh, the, the pro-life leaders around the country. And that got the, actually the pro-life uh, group involved now that Elvita is heading up. Well, you know, I, I tell you, we're very blessed to have Elvita on, on board. And if anyone wants to invite her into the community, I know she's available to come. And she especially likes to, after she gives a talk at a big banquet, the next morning is to have breakfast uh, with the African-American pastors in that community. Well, stick with us, and when we come back, we're going to take a question from you, our viewers, and give you some more action you can do to help bring it into abortion. Stay tuned. Social justice begins in the womb. That's a pro-life principle. It's also the title of a book written by Brian Kempa, our full-time youth director at Priest for Life. All of social justice is based on the dignity of the human person and the right to life. In the light of his own personal conversion and his experience in conveying the pro-life message to youth in a secular world, Brian gives all of us the language we need to defend the pro-life message and to challenge those who say they want social justice but forget to oppose the most basic injustice, namely abortion. Written in a personal, direct way, and filled with useful tools, Social Justice in the Womb is a timely book for your plural life work. To order this book, contact us at our toll-free number, 888-735-3448, or go online, prolifeproducts.org. Thank you. Welcome back to our Defending Life program, where now we are going to take a question from one of you, our viewers. Well, Father Dennis, today's question comes from Juliana, and she's from Corpus Christi, Texas, and she writes, Someone told me that the battle over marriage is the most important moral issue of our day, but I always thought it was pro-life. What do you say? Well, Juliana, that's a very good question, and thank you for sending it to us. You are right. The battle for life itself is the most important. Why? Because without life, we don't have anything. Life, as the church has taught over and over, is in the words of blessed John Paul II, the most basic and fundamental right and the condition of all other personal rights in <laughs> Christo Fidelis Leici. We have to defend the integrity of marriage as well as the right to religious freedom. But you cannot be free, you cannot be religious, and you cannot be married unless you have life, unless you have been allowed to be born. The right to life is so fundamental that it is towering over every other issue. It is the foundation of every other issue. It is, in fact, at the core of every other issue. And though the church teaches this clearly, it is true independent of church teaching. We can know this from reason and common sense. Nothing takes more victims than abortion. Neither crime, nor disease, nor terrorism, nor war, nor poverty, nor AIDS, or drug abuse, or even cancer. Abortion is the number one scourge on the human family. Nor is anything more destructive of the family itself. Abortion, by definition, it destroys the parent-child relationship and likewise destroys the relationship of the mother and father and harms their ability to properly parent other children. 
The negative effects, moreover, do not just extend to other family members and beyond, but also extend from one generation to the next. At Priests for Life, we have many articles and teachings about why the most important moral issue of our day is abortion and why it will continue to be so, not until some other issue comes along, but rather until abortion is ended. Check out our website for these teachings and quotations from church documents, priestsforlife.org. Thanks for your question. At any time, you can go to prolifequestions.com and send us more questions. Well, thank you, Father. And we want to remind, like you just said, our viewers, they can send us those questions either email, snail mail, or call our office. Our pro-life uh, outreach department and our staff is always standing on by, ready to help. Also, too, I want to remind our viewers that we have our newsletter. It comes out six times a year, Priest for Life newsletter. Again, tells a whole wealth of activities going on at Priest for Life and in the pro-life movement. And again, that's available snail mail or email. Well, let's remind people, we had Alveda as our guest, and of course, there's a statement that has put, been put out uh, by uh, Alveda, and especially her, uh, her mother, Naomi, uh, A.D. King's uh, wife, called The Beloved Community and the Unborn. Mm -hmm. Very powerful statement. It's available that people can view it at AfricanAmericanOutreach.com. They can download the statement, and it's really a tool, wouldn't you say, Father? It's great. Yeah, it's an amazing instrument. You know, it tells, us, it tells people how to really understand life and, and the experience that they had in the life and so forth, yeah. Well, and also, too, what they can do is, besides they signing it, okay, they can take it and to their African-American friends and get them to sign it, black pastors. Very prominent people, besides the members of the King family, have signed this statement, including Gloria Jackson, and she's the great-granddaughter of Booker T. Washington, including Lynn Jackson, and she's the great-great-granddaughter, no relation, but also she was the great-great-granddaughter of Dred Scott. So the goal here is, is raises this awareness in the African-American community by signing onto this statement that the beloved community, which is a statement that, you know, Martin Luther King coined quite often, the beloved community, well, now we're going to use it to say it includes the unborn. And I hope many of our viewers download that statement and sign it. Well, Father, thank you again for another exciting program on Defending Life. And brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us on Defending Life. And remember, we also have a Spanish version of this program on EWTN Spanish channel. Before you go, let me offer you three items. First, there is the Will to Live, a document to help you and your loved ones make medical decisions in difficult circumstances and to protect you and them from being pressured to do things contrary to moral law. This document enables you to appoint someone you know and trust to speak for you if you cannot speak for yourself and is made according to the laws of each of the 50 states. Father Pavone strongly endorses this document and we will send it to you free of charge if you contact us at Priest for Life. Second, we offer mass cards both for the living and the deceased and we will send you as many as you want free of charge to enroll your loved ones in the daily prayers and masses that Father Pavone, Father Dennis Wild, and the whole Priest for Life family celebrate each day. Use these for birthdays, graduations, anniversaries, or other occasions as well as that those sad moments saying farewell to those who have died. Let us know today how many mass cards you would like and we'll send them to you. And finally, third, pray along with us throughout the year by ordering our new and revised pro-life prayer book called In the Palm of His Hand. You'll find prayers for all occasions and liturgical seasons. And remember, you can invite Father Pavone, Father Dennis Wall, myself, and other members of our Priest for Life team like Alveda King to your churches, communities, and pro-life events. Check out our website for details at priestforlife.org. And on behalf of Father Frank Pavone, our National Director, and all our Priest for Life family, I urge you to let us hear from you. Send us your success stories or questions and comments. And remember, we're not just here to fight abortion, we're here to end it, and we will. Join us again next week on Defending Life.